Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program, we have an artist named Lizzie and the Makers. Uh, I had a great conversation with uh, with Lizzie Edwards from Lizzie and the Makers um, about her her band, her musical history, uh, the, you know how deep music runs in her her family, which is uh, really cool as well, um, and her band's new album, uh, Deer on the Wall. Uh, so we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, before we do, uh, kind of give a status update on where things are. Um, just a couple things that are going on, really. Um, first off, COVID is rampant. It's going to hit everybody, it feels like, right? I mean, I, I don't know how I've skirted it so far, but somehow I have, or seemingly have. Uh, you know, it's hard to know. Sometimes you have it and you don't even know if you don't take a test, apparently, right? Because this, especially with this most recent strain, it's really mild. And this past weekend, um, it came pretty close. Um, a couple weeks ago, it came pretty close and that, you know, my best friend uh, had it, but no one else in his family and myself did not get, uh, did not get it, even though we'd had a meal together. Um, and so this past weekend, I told my daughter that she could have a sleepover um, with her, her friend, that her friend can come over to our house and, uh, and have a sleepover. Uh, she'd been going through some stuff and wanted to, uh, to see her friend who she doesn't get to see too often because they're not in the same grade. Um, and I said, sure, why not? Uh, so we pick up uh, my daughter's friend on the, fr on the Friday night um, after my daughter got out of dance and, um, and then the sleepover um, existed. Not much sleeping happening at a sleepover, by the way, for a tween girl. Just going to throw that out there. Um, they really need to think about renaming sleepover, like maybe up all nighter or, or something is uh, is a better name. We'll work on it. We'll work on it. But uh, the uh, my daughter's friend stayed over. The next morning, um, I was on the Peloton and doing a class, my 1150th ride, actually, um, I, I was doing, and then I get a call from my daughter's friend's dad, and uh, he uh, was calling to let me know that he had COVID, and he would not be able to travel to Canada for his work trip that he was anticipating going on in, you know, just a couple of days. Well, um, I'm like, okay, great, great, I'm going to finish this ride, and then we'll f uh, figure it out, right? So I finished my ride and then woke uh, two girls up at 10 o'clock and, and told them, hey, you know, by the way, your dad has COVID uh, and we, we're gonna go down to the school and get some at-home tests just so we can, we can have them because they were giving them out for a few hours. Uh, I gave my uh, friend, my daughter's friends uh, I give her a COVID test, an at-home COVID test, which it was, it would still be really early for her to show symptoms, but, um, or test positive, but just to placate, you know, everybody gave the test. She was negative. Um, I did not give my kids a test nor take one myself. Uh, no, so no, none of us have had any, uh, symptoms, uh, at the, as of the date of this recording. So, um, so maybe we skirted it. I don't know. I guess we're gonna find out here uh, in the in the future. And you know, I mean, if we can, from what I hear, if we can make it through the next couple of weeks, we're a lot better off. That um, January is the heavy month for uh, for this variant. But I just heard this morning there's a super variant coming where it's a mix of Delta and Omicron, and it's Delta Cron or whatever uh, whatever is called there. So more to come on that, right? Uh, it doesn't end. It's not going away. Um, the only way to fight it is to, you know, be boosted, is my understanding. All right, um, all of that mess out of the way. I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the Bottle Rock lineup that amount, that was announced this week. Um, so Bottle Rock Napa Valley is back, um, seemingly uh, coming back in May um, for Memorial Day weekend um, with a a big old lineup that they dropped this week and I'm gonna go through a couple of the artists that are playing. Um, Metallica, Pink, 21 Pilots and Luke Combs are all of the headliners. Uh, so it's a big festival that's pretty much in my backyard, very, very close. I, um, I enjoy uh, biking to it and going to it. Um, I've done it most years at this point, I've, I've been to it. There was, um, a time where we got to cover it for, uh, you know, for a couple of years until Bottle Rock stopped uh, giving Concert Pipeline media uh, credentials. But this past year, 
we were able to uh, to have fan media credentials because I had an interview with a, a band um, that uh, that was playing. So it worked out well. I was able to um, enjoy media access, whatever you know, and get some free snacks from the media room. That was nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, the drinks from the media room helped make that minute that festival survivable because even having some bubbly water or something um, when it's hot. Uh, and you're out in, in the sun all day um, and not just having to have the, you know, wait in line for one of the water stations it was really enjoyable. Um, so, uh, so that's the head, those are the headliners. Um, there are a couple of other bands that I'd be interested in seeing, uh, but Metallica uh, would be really fun to see. It's, it's hard to not go to see Metallica when they're in my backyard. And I know they're here and they've played shows here. I would have loved to have been at the uh, Metallica show that they did at the Independent um, last year in San Francisco. Really small venue for uh, for them, and um, and it seemed like a really cool show. But um, but they'll blow the roof off of if there were a roof at Bottle Rock, they would blow the roof off of that venue. Um, also, Pink, not really fan. I'm, I'm sure she'd put on a good live show. Uh, Twenty One Pilots. I'm into their stuff. I dig. I dig them. I think that would be a fun show. And Luke Combs, not a country dude, so not really interested in that. Um, some of the supporting acts uh, that are playing Bottle Rock. Let's talk through a couple of those. Black Crows, um, reunited, and it feels so good. I don't know. Uh, reunited and the paychecks probably feel pretty good because when you have a band like that that's been around forever, but then broke up for a couple of years and gave get back together you're like oh gotta go see them um i'd be interested in seeing the black crows again um i saw them in 2006 i believe when they opened for tom petty at the greek theater in berkeley and they put on a really good show uh, i really enjoyed their their set uh opening for tom petty and it would be fun to to see them again so i'm uh, i'm hoping that um that some of these show, bands that I do want to see all line up on the same day. That's never how it works, right? It's the, the bands you want to see are all spread throughout the weekend um, so that you have to go to the, the whole festival, right? I don't know that I could do a three-day festival again, uh, but we have to see. Um, there's there's a super collaboration between like uh, Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube, E-40, um, you know, that's, that's happening. Um, uh, you know, I might check that out if, if it landed at the right spot. Bleachers is another band that I would really want to see live, although I wasn't crazy about their newest album. I only listened to it a couple of times, but it just it didn't click and resonate like uh, Bleachers debut album did. And even Bleachers second album um, I was was decent. They've been progress getting progressively not as great. Let me just say that. But I love the band. Jack Antonoff is uh, an amazing musician. Uh, they put on a really great live show, and I would uh, I would be really excited to see them again. Uh, Michael Franti, he always puts on an awesome live show, and it's usually a staple of Bottle Rock. He plays most years. Uh, I don't think he played last year at all, but he plays most years. Silver Sun Pickups um, is a band that uh, um, I enjoy. Uh, I I can't say I'm a huge fan of them, but I saw them a couple years back uh, playing live, and I'm like, yeah, it's one of those bands that, that's uh, that I'm like, okay, yeah, I I like to, uh, I like their live show, I like their live performance, and I'm like, I should listen to them more, but then I don't really the, listen to them a ton more um, after that, right? Um, and let's see who else. I'm trying to see if there's any other artists that I really care about. Fantastic Negrito, I hear good things about. Uh, him, um, and then we get into a lot of small, smaller bands that uh, um, not a, you know, I was crazy about. Atlas Genius, they put on a, a really good show. I actually saw them at a festival with uh, Silver Sun Pickups um, in Sonoma, um, and that's mostly it, I think. Uh, so a lot of the artists, I'm like, meh, I could take or leave, um, and uh, some of them I'd like to see. So Maybe I'll go for one day, we'll see. Um, obviously things can change if I end up getting an interview and the concert pipeline gets to cover it, but that is the Bottle Rock lineup for uh, 2022. Again, Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, three day passes are on sale now for while they last, but 
my recommendation is waiting until right before the event um, to get your tickets. Um, the the mitten supply is usually higher than the demand at that point. So um, you can get tickets for a bit cheaper. Um, all right. So that's kind of what's going on in the uh, world right now. Um, let's go ahead and let's bring in our guest. Again, I had a chance to uh, talk to Lizzie from um, Lizzie and the Makers, and we, we just had a really fun chat. And here it is. Hey, Lizzie, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I am doing really good. Thank you. Doing really yeah. good. Yeah. How's your year starting out so far? Um, so far, so good. Um, we just had a lot of snow here uh, in New York City. So um, I'm bundled up. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Waiting for things to reopen, trying to survive this current wave of Omicron or whatever. But uh, yeah. I'm I'm living living the dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it, so everything's shutting there, right? I mean, I saw your your one of your concerts was pushed back a week. Uh, also, yeah. I mean, that was actually because of a wedding, um, mm. which is annoying. Um, but <laughs> yeah, everything kind of shut down, but things are starting to reopen again. Um, luckily, I feel like everyone got. I mean, not luckily that everyone got sick, but everyone kind of got sick around the same time so <laughs> we're all emerging from quarantine simultaneously and uh hoping that by by mid to late january um we'll be slowly back at it but um yeah i had a show at the end of the month that got postponed to march um it's i had a show in december that got postponed to february so it's kind of the new normal like i don't really expect any of my shows to happen when they're scheduled lately yeah um rolling with it as best i can um doing virtual stuff as much as possible <laughs> yeah you've been able to play a couple of shows though right yeah yeah there were a couple right before christmas that we were able to do and then we kind of out of caution canceled some um in between christmas and new year's it just felt my guitarist got covid and then it just it just felt like it wasn't a good idea um especially in new york i feel like we're all kind of collectively suffering from the same trauma um so even if we went on with the shows i don't know if anyone would come to the shows and, and everybody's yeah. nervous and it's going around it's hitting everybody and, and i get it and you know yeah. it's here here in california are... too i'm, oh, I'm california. in california yeah in napa um and oh, my Oh, I know. Yeah, it's not bad here. Oh, I'll give you a, <laughs> I'll give you a spin here. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Nice. Holy crap. That's amazing right? view. Wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty nice. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, COVID's, COVID's all around. I mean, tonight I was supposed to go to a comedy show in San Francisco um, with Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, Weird Al, and Ken Jennings. So oh, my God. That would have been amazing. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was so bummed when it got the whole festival got uh, postponed. But there, I mean, there's like I don't know, 150 comedy shows as part of the festival uh, over a couple of weeks. I'm like, there's no way they're going to be able to reschedule it, right? So yeah, I feel like that's got to have to wait until next year, maybe. I don't know. It's yeah. it's hard to know, right? It's hard to know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, as much as we're like, we've been through this already, so we're prepared this time around, you never know. Um, I'm hoping that this though, since Omicron is contagious, but less, um, I don't know, what, I don't wanna say lethal, that sounds dramatic, but it's, yeah, yeah. Like it's milder, maybe that this means the variants are just gonna get weaker and weaker and hopefully we're on, on the way out of this. Uh, it's funny, last Christmas, uh, my mom and I spent it together and I brought us these Christmas masks like with candy canes on them. Uh -huh. And I threw them out because I was like, we're not gonna need them next year, there's no way. <laughs> and then this Christmas came around, I was like, yeah, I should have saved them. We definitely still need them, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know, but. Yeah, how, how did the shows that you played fe uh, feel like? I mean, what was the dynamic? Did it feel natural and did you kind of feel that connection with the audience? 
I did. I mean, if the first, you know, when we first started playing live shows again, it was of May, 2020, and they were all outdoor shows. And even though, you know, people were masked and six feet apart, so you didn't kind of have that crowd energy, right? Of people feeding off each other and um, just based on like physical proximity. Um, the weird part was after doing months of live streams, we played our first song and then heard applause because <laughs> we hadn't been hearing that. And like, we, what's that sound again? <laughs> we all cried. We were just like, oh my God, applause. Um, so, and then when we started playing indoors again, I mean, it was a slow build, but I mean, people were just ready and it felt great and it felt even greater than before. I think people have a new level of appreciation for live music. Um, you know, when, when you're used to having access to something on a regular basis and that is taken away from you, I think when we all came back, it was just kind of the energy was crazier than ever. Um, but it was kind of a roller coaster with this recent surge. It was like everybody was just back into it. And then it just was a huge, you know, fall. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was hard, um, but it was great for a second there. <laughs> it was great yeah. while we were back. Yeah. Uh, and, I've, and people were ready. I mean, people were ready. People are vaccinated. They're ready. So I don't know. Yeah, what can you do? But uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But let's, so let's talk about you a little bit. And you grew up in a musical family. Um, you know, kind of going back to your your grandparents who were opera singers a little bit. Did did, did they influence you in any way? Did you uh, have a connection with them? Um, I had more so of a connection with my grandmother. So my grandmother was a, a classical harpsichordist, and I grew up playing classical piano, and so. She and I bonded, and it's funny, my, my piano teacher could always tell when I had spent time with my grandma because I just played better in my lessons. She was like, oh, you were with your grandma, weren't you? I was like, yeah, because <laughs> I've never been the best at practicing. Um, but um, my grandfather I was always intimidated by because I sang and I sing, but I'm a more of a blues and jazz singer. Opera singing is a completely different animal to me, something that takes so much skill and training. And I mean, you're speaking all these foreign languages as well. Um, so growing up with him, I always felt a lot more pressure trying to impress him. Um, and my dad felt the same way. My dad was like a rock guitarist. So, you know, he had that kind of traditional experience with his parents where, you know, rock was noise to them and they didn't get it. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, 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 one of the last, concerts my grandfather came to I sang and I think I sang a Tracy Chapman song and he you know in his very reserved way was very uh uh you know gave me a lot of praise um so uh that was great but but it was always hard with him because I just felt like you know opera is a whole other level um there's actually a funny story about him we were at a, a family friend's house in the uh family the father of the family loved Jimmy Buffett obsessed with Jimmy Buffett so we had like this wall of cassette tapes this is how long ago that was that all had Jimmy Buffett and my grandfather was looking at them and he turned to him and said who's Jimmy Buffet and uh I just always got a kick out of that but that that's kind of you know my grandfather was just not could not really relate to any yeah. <laughs> contemporary music or was even aware of it i mean jimmy buffet i just think that's so funny um oh that's awesome yeah but but yeah i think it was from a young age i just felt like it it was a natural progression for me to pursue music it was just in my blood um and yeah so still, still doing it today i feel like there's nothing else i'm i'm really good at so <laughs> It's, it's your passion and like you said it's in your blood and and so you you mentioned your dad like he played with Chuck Berry right yeah so he um was a sideman for Chuck Berry uh when he was living in Iowa um and you know back then it was cheaper for musicians like Chuck Berry to tour the states and pick up bands at uh on certain legs so my dad would play with him in his like little midwest tour um and he was, I think, like 19 at the time. 
and very, uh, I don't know, uh, very bold as a 19 year old guitarist. And there was one show he did with Chuck Berry where, uh, you know, his signature move was the duck walk that he'd do across the stage. And my dad uh-huh. did it with him. And Chuck Berry got very, very upset. He was He's like, like, that's my thing. That's my, yeah, you know? that's my move. You're not allowed to do it. My dad's like, what? I'm just enthusiastic. He's like, no, boy. <laughs> you stand in the back. This is my thing. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He, uh, he opened for Martha the Mandela's a couple times. Um, so yeah, he was really heavy into that, that genre and that, that uh, era of, of rock and, and Motown and um, R&B and, and all of that, uh, those groups, yeah. Did he want you to be in music? Like, did, I mean, after his experiences and everything, is that something he was really supportive of? Did he let it come, did it come naturally? What did that look like? Um, he was, I think at first he and my mom decided they weren't gonna force me to do anything. It was all gonna be up to me if I wanted to. And they did this with everything, with music, with sports, with religion. They were very much, I think they grew up in families that were the opposite. And so for them, it was important that their kids really made their own decisions based on their own passions and not, you know, weren't forced to do something. And so I was, I did a kid's music class um, because I just from a young age, like to sing, make up songs. And uh, one of the girls in my class was playing piano um, one day and I was like, I want to do that. And so I definitely chose it on my own. But then once I started it, my dad was my biggest fan and very supportive and almost to a fault at some time. Yeah. <laughs> um, we would perform together a lot and, and it was, it was fun. We would argue a lot about stuff. Um, but he was a little bit of a stage dad, I guess. Uh, but I loved it, you know. Uh, it's great to have a parent supportive of what you're doing, especially in a medium like music, which is, you know, a lot of parents would be like, find a real job. Uh, that's a cute hobby, but go to medical school or something, go to law school. <laughs> and yeah, he was always very supportive. My mom was too, but she does not have a musical bone in her body. I mean, she can barely carry a tune, but too supportive nonetheless. Uh, so yeah, it was, I, I would not be here today without their support and encouragement because uh, I doubt myself a lot. And again, you know, being in the arts is, is hard. There's not a direct path. It's not necessarily lucrative. Uh, a lot of people don't see it as a real career choice. So I owe, I owe a lot to both of them. I would not be here without their encouragement. So, yeah. Yeah. Did your love for Billie Holiday come from your dad as well? I know you have, you, like, she's really important to you. You have a Billie Holiday tattoo, you know, on your yes. arm. Yes. Yeah, I actually have three Billie Holiday tattoos. Wow, okay. <laughs> and they're all here. So I have a, a portrait of her, and then I have uh-huh. lyrics from her song, Lady Sings the Blues. And then I have gardenias on my left shoulder, because that was the, you know, flower she wore. Um, My dad was a definitely jazz lover and so I listened to a lot of jazz because of him and a lot of jazz vocals vocalists because of him and Billy just struck me because she didn't sound like anyone else I mean I mean so same with Ella Fitzgerald you know they have their unique sound but there's something about her singing that was just so emotional um and poignant and You could just hear so much pain in her voice. Um, But I just also loved the fact that she had such a unique sound. And I just started reading all about her, listening to her. I wrote papers about her in middle school. Like I just was fascinated by her and and how she came to be uh, the singer she became um, and, and the struggles she went through. But being um, obsessed with her uh, translates into my current you know, musical pursuits in the sense that I feel like it's really important to have your own sound. It's really important to not try to be like someone else or try to write like someone else or try to write a song and be like, I want these all to sound like Led Zeppelin. You know, I, I, I really, she inspires me because I really think that's the most important thing 
as an artist, uh, you can use kind of as your compass. It's just being authentic, um, being yourself. It's the same thing with Janis Joplin, you know? It's like you hear her and you know it's her. You know it's her. Um, and so that that's a lot of my love for her, not just because Billy's talented and she wrote some really great songs as well, um, but because she just, no one sounds like Billy. No one will ever sound sound like her. Um, and I, I hope I hope to be to be continuing to develop my own sound. I'm I'm nowhere near Billy Holiday or Janice status, but but yeah, that's kind of how I guide myself when I'm writing and performing. It's just being true to my sound um, and not trying to copycat anybody. How would you say your sound's changed over the uh, the time that you've been singing? Like, what? How have you kind of branded and kind of built your molded your? I guess I'd say your your sound. Um, I think at first, as far as writing, um, I wrote a lot of blues and I, I really love singing the blues. Um, you know, people say, will say, well, all blues songs sound the same because there is a form, there's a structure, but that's not true. I mean, even though there is a form, I think that form really allows you to improvise. It really allows you to write your own melody and change it every time. I mean, it's so easy for me to just kind of improvise over blues chords. Whereas a song, you know, that maybe chord wise is interesting and, and different, you, you're, you're kind of relegated to singing, you know, you're, you've got a narrower uh, um, choice uh, of options as far as where to go with your voice. Um, but over the years, I, I started to really blend my love of blues and jazz with like my love of bands like Pink Floyd and ambient sound like that and spaciness and kind of a, or like a psychedelic aspect, um, you know, that aspect of their songs. So I was like, how do I combine these? And at, over the years writing and writing with my partner, Greg, um, we really kind of started to incorporate all of these influences. And now I think the songs we write, I mean, they're, there really is like, you can hear the blues, but you hear a little shoegazy aspect. You can definitely hear some David Gilmore influences and Greg's guitar playing. Um, and so I think we, I've become more confident in exploring these other things as opposed to sticking to what I'm comfortable with. Um, and then the, uh, this new album we put out, I think we definitely do that. I mean, we, we get out of our comfort zone. Um, which is good. Uh, I think you, that's how you grow as an artist. If you stick to what you're comfortable with, you're just gonna, you're never gonna grow or discover a new sound or, or really push the boundaries of, of genre blending. You know, I, I don't ever wanna say, fusion is kind of a dirty word, um, <laughs> but we do kind of fuse together a lot of different influences. And yeah, I think I would not have been as comfortable 10 years ago I would have been terrified to try to experiment or write anything outside of my comfort zone. So I think I've definitely grown in that way. And then just singing wise too, I think I started out as a belter rock and roll because I could, and a yeah. lot of people pigeonholed me in that way. And they'd be like, oh, you got to sing ACDC. You got to sing Led Zeppelin. You got to sing Janis Joplin. And now I, I do kind of experiment a lot more with my, you know, soprano voice, my head voice, not always belting, um, but kind of exploring the softer side of my, of my vocals and what I can do there and, and what I can express in that way. So it's not just power, power, power. Um, you know, subtlety can speak volumes too. You don't just have to yell in the microphone all the time. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, Greg McMillan. Um, tell me about the dynamic between you two, like how you balance off of each each other, and kind of how you uh, came to work with him to um, to make Lizzie and the Makers. Um, so, I really was, I mean, fate. I'm going to use that word. Um, the way we met. I mean, he played at a venue where I worked as a sound engineer, um, and I we first our first gig we played was because I was supposed to play in a festival at this venue band my whole band basically quit it wasn't I wasn't the band leader but they basically all dropped out and 
me being stubborn, I was like, well, I'm still going to play. I'm just going to put a band together in a week and figure it out. And he overheard this and said he wanted to be in the band. So our first gig, it was most, it was just covers and we played and it, the dynamic was there, the chemistry was there. And then we just kind of, he pushed me to write. He said, here's, I'm going to send you this demo. It's instrumental. See what you can do with it. And so I worked on it and we got together and it just worked. I mean, what I, what he wrote, like a melody came to me right away. And what I wrote, was exactly what he was envisioning. And I, it's like, we're each other's musical translators and soulmates. And he can, you know, I can send him a nonsensical string of chords and be like, I have this idea and it doesn't make any sense on paper. And he gets exactly what, what's in my head. Um, and so, you know, we've been writing together ever since. It's really hard to quit that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, so well and it's so organic and and we just seem to be musical soulmates in that way um and he you know we've we've had our moments he did quit the band for a while and then I got stubborn and recorded an album without him just to be like I can do this without you and then you know I think we lasted a year and then we're like this is ridiculous nothing is as good that we do on our own so um, so he came back. <laughs> Sometimes you got to find that out through the separation, right? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, it's it's also I think collaboration with people is good. I don't want to only write with him, and he doesn't only write with me. He works with a lot of other people. But as far as our vision for this band and and what we're doing with this band, it just it it just works. Yeah, it just works. Yeah. It's easy. It's so easy. It shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah. And you have Reeves and Mario, you know, they, they're there for mostly for the live shows, right? Like, uh, tell me how they got looped into the project as well. Um, so, so Greg and Reeves have known each other for a really, really long time. They knew each other back when they both lived in LA. And this is like 25 plus years ago. Um, I'm aging them now, but it's a fact. Um, and we, we had always self-produced, um, but it felt like we just needed another perspective. We didn't really want to work with anybody that was going to change what we were already doing or try to take away our sound uh, that we had developed over the years. Um, but we want, we felt like we just needed someone else, like to tweak something here or there. It was missing something. And Reeves was in between tours with The Cure, who he's been playing with for the last eight years, I think at least, maybe more. And he saw that on Greg's social media that we had shows and he was bored. And I reached out to Greg and was like, can I play with you guys in these shows? And Greg said, uh, of course you can. And so he jumped on board and he loved the music. And it was, I was so nervous. I was just like, God, like this guy's going to come play with us and be like, what a waste of time. What am I doing? Um, these guys are such amateurs playing like little dive bars. And, and the opposite was true. He just really fell in love with our songs and, and with us. And he and Mario had worked together on a David Bowie, a couple of David Bowie albums and had been wanting to work together again. And so he invited Mario, Reeves invited Mario to one of these shows and was playing with us. And Mario loved it too. And they were just like, you're our project. We've been looking for something and this is it. And we were like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to say no. Arguments. no. Yeah. And, and so it kind of is reminiscent of those fairy tale stories you hear about ba you know, bands playing to nobody, but there's one producer there. And they go, you, you've got it, and I want to work with you. And it, and it happened like that. I mean, you, it doesn't really happen anymore, but that's kind of how this happened for us. And working with them in the studio was so great because it was exactly what we needed. They didn't want to change us. They didn't want us to rewrite anything. There were just little things that uh, they advised us on based on their experience. I mean, they worked with David Bowie and Prince and the freaking cure and uh so little things like cut this solo in half or maybe this bridge should modulate here um to make it more interesting or even with my singing style like I said you know don't belt on this song like 
try to try to be a little lighter and softer and more emotional and vulnerable. And it, and it was just a, the missing like ingredient in the recipe. You know, it was just this yeah. little pinch of something that wasn't a drastic change, but it was enough to to really be the missing link and the key to, to developing our our sound further. And, and they're just so nice and they're funny too. And I got to hear yeah. lots of stories while we were recording, so. They, they share stories about Bowie and Prince and that sort of thing. Like, did you get to hear about like any yeah. of that experience? I mean, yeah, there are some funny stories about Prince where, you know, Mario was like, you know, had limited interaction with him personally. You know, he's on yeah. the other side of the glass mostly. And uh, I don't know. I remember there was some story it was like, I think Prince said one sentence to him the whole time. And it was like, don't fuck this up kid or something like that. Um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, Bowie, they just both, had so much great I mean he things to say about him he was just such a generous spirit and amazing musician and and I mean talk about growing and developing as a songwriter you know he had so many different characters and personas um but they were authentic I mean they were they reflected where he was in his life he wasn't trying to become a character or trying to create a story it was just he was very true to himself and I mean they just it, it sounded like he was a dream to work with and very inspiring um and yeah they miss him a lot <laughs> and uh he's definitely gone too soon um but it's interesting hearing hearing them talk about him because you do have artists that I think try to they try too hard to be something they're not and they they admire Bowie and they admire the different uh, personas he had. And so they try to kind of force themselves into this new mold to be interesting, but it's, a, it, you can tell it's forced. You can tell the songs are kind of empty. They're, they're not coming from, from their, you know, souls and their hearts and, and their experiences. And, and with Bowie, it was like, that's what was so remarkable about him is that he was so many different kinds of artists, but they were all him. They were all yeah. authentic and original and him and coming from, a, you can hear it in his songs. I mean, they're genuine, they move you and it doesn't sound forced. It doesn't sound like, um, you know, like I'll use an example, St. Vincent as an example. Mm. I, I love her and I admire her, um, but I do feel like with this new album she has, The Daddy's Home, I feel like, she was trying to do what Bowie did and, and take on this new character, this new person. But I, I, I think it was too contrived. That's just my, my opinion. Um, she'll never hear this. So, um, and if, if she does, I'm sorry, St. Vincent, I love you. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I feel like the line we're always walking as artists, right? It's like, we wanna do something new and interesting and different, but you still somehow have to have yourself in it or else it it doesn't translate i think to the audience um that's i mean that's a in bowie was great at prince was great at you know um, yeah so. i mean that well that's a good segue to your new album right deer on the wall where um uh, i mean it is very personal and um and you do put a lot of yourself into uh into this album i mean we can talk about a couple of the songs off the album um in particular like mermaid right that's uh that questions the sudden end to like a love affair that you had right yes uh, and and so you're writing from this personal experience and and being vulnerable in your your music tell, tell me kind of about that process for you um you know i i I'm a very autobiographical songwriter. Um, you know, write what you know, right? But um, yeah. I've always admired singers or, and songwriters that can like tell a story and like tell a, a story. But for me, it's just always been a very personal cathartic process. And a lot of my lyrics come from like journaling. Um, and it's it's kind of a tool I've used for songwriting for a long time where I actually will start with a random word. So I'll like take a book and go to open a page and point at a word and use that word and then just start writing from that word. And, um, you know, at first it's weird and it's like disjointed and then it 
it just kind of gets to this place. And even if, you know, I set a timer for like five minutes or something and um, it, it's always personal, but I, it, I'll end up getting like one line or something out of three pages. And this one line will pop up that I'm like, yes, this works. And then I'll start writing from that line and write a song from there. And and I, you know, I, I sometimes feel bad about being so personal. I mean, people give like Taylor Swift a lot of like um, grief for writing about all these breakups and stuff. But I mean, like heartbreak songs have been around forever and there's a kind of catharsis in, in writing about these things you go through. It's therapy, you know, it's like, I write yeah. about it, I process it, but also it's also a very universal feeling like these things we go through it's a very human condition to experience heartbreak or love or joy or sadness and and so even though they come from a very personal place I also feel like as a result they're really relatable and even though it might be about a specific thing I went through I feel like someone else can listen to it and um you know understand it as their own experience or or relate to it in their own way. Um, and so that's kind of what works for me. And I'm, I've written a couple, we've written a couple songs that are like stories and fictional stories that aren't personal. And those are great, but I've always just been more of a, yeah, personal tragedy <laughs> song, song lyricist. <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, like Lover by Proxy, that kind of ties into Mermaid in, in a sense. And I mean, was that part of the same writing session? Like, uh, it, was, is... it was the same period of time. It, it's definitely about the same person. Um, you know, a lot of so the songs on this album, and those, those two especially, um, are about different phases in the process of moving on from something or getting over someone. So whereas in Mermaid, it's like, you're confused, you don't know what's happening. You're questioning everything um, from the relationship to like, why are we here? You know, on a very grand scale. Um, and there's like this melancholy in that where you just kind of feel lost and you want answers. Lover by Proxy is kind of the point uh, in the process where you're like, all right, now I'm mad. <laughs> now I'm defiant and now I see what this for what it was and I'm not questioning it anymore and I'm gonna be direct with you and but also empowered by it and I'm gonna move on from it triumphantly and learn from it but also you know F you and <laughs> um, so same person you know it wasn't the same session that I wrote those in but um, definitely the same period of time getting over <laughs> this person um, and trying to move on from it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I tried yeah. not to write all the songs about that person. <laughs> a lot of them it's, are about that. <laughs> it's cathartic; it helps to get it out, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and so for uh, for this album um, as a whole, like, what did you? What were some of your takeaways from your um, your last album, "Fire from the Heart of Man"? Like that you were. Able, what did you learn from that experience that you were able to apply to this, to this album? Um. So that experience. I mean, we were so young as songwriters. And I think even though a lot of those songs were personal um, and came from the same place that the new songs come from, um, we just weren't really there yet as far as tapping into ourselves and our like authenticity. Like, I think we were still a little bit trying to make these songs sound all fit in a genre or like fit in a box a little bit. Um, and we pushed it a, a tiny bit on some songs. They got a little weird. Like there's one song, uh, Sicker Than You, where we got very Tom Waitsy with it, which is something we wouldn't normally do and use weird sounds. And um, that was kind of the start to something new um, down the line. But I think it just it fell kind of flat like when I look back on it because I think we were trying to be safe and play it safe um because we thought people would like it more um if we were less strange <laughs> and I think from that you know 
while we were recording, it felt like the right thing to do. And it felt like, okay, we're playing it safe and, and conventional and this is good. And I, but now I think we look back on it and, and when we went to record this album, we were like, we are not playing it safe. Like we want to have something, there's got to be something strange in every song, something unexpected, something maybe people aren't going to like because they don't get it and it's not conventional, but we don't care. Like that's what we're drawn to. Let's do it. Um, and so we learned a lot in that sense. Like if it's what you think you want to do, just do it. Don't be scared. Um, don't think, oh, people are going to think this is weird or no one's going to want to hear it. It's kind of like being true to ourselves as artists. We're not writing because we're recording this album because we want people to like it necessarily. You know, we're recording, we're making art. We're recording what, what speaks to us and hopefully other people get something out of it too. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, I feel, I feel like this one felt right. <laughs> and that yeah. one felt, I, I don't know, it doesn't sound like us. Uh, and and our, it didn't sound like our live shows. It just, it sounded just very perfect and safe. Um, so we'll never do that again. <laughs> right, right. And, and obviously we're in a different time. We talked about that, but you know, but what is the response been to this album that you've heard so far? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. It's actually the, the people, the song that people seem to like the most or that a lot of people like the most is the one that is so not what we've ever done before. Um, and it's not, uh, so like waiting for the teeth is a song that's just very, there's a lot of ambience. There's a lot of darkness and, in the texture of it and it's not a blues song it's not a rock song it's not a traditional anything it's just kind of coming from our stream of consciousness and it's been nice to hear people like that like that was the one I was like this is the throwaway track people are going to listen to this and be like I don't get it I don't want it and a lot of people have been like this song is amazing and that's been great like that people are responding to the songs that we didn't think people would respond to that we kind of maybe even buried at the end of the album because we're like ah, if they even get to get to that song they'll listen to it and so that's been really nice and it's really um built our confidence as artists where the songs that we feel like are most ourselves are the ones that people like and we're like oh okay you know I thought it was going to be this one that's just a straight rock song people know us as that as like a rock band and and no they're like this one is great so so that's that's been nice. I mean, Mojo Hand too, which is like seven minutes long and and in seven, and and a little self indulgent, I'll say. But um, people love that. I mean, when we played that live, people were like, "What's that song? The Pots and Pans song?" And we're like, "That's the one you like, really? It's not our like Freddie King cover or like our Janis Joplin cover. You like this one? All right." cool we'll keep writing you can get away with a seven that. minute song sometimes you know and, yeah. it's, uh, and it and it can be really good it's you can't can't do it on every album or anything but no. uh but throw a seven minute song in there you know and it's solid like you know people yeah. will dig it <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it's been nice to get positive responses from from the maybe more otherworldly tracks and not the straightforward ones yeah um tell me a little bit about pete's candy store uh you've You've done a lot of shows there, right? So like, what has that experience been like for you? That place is great. I mean, that's where we got our, that's where we played our first gig ever. Um, and, you know, it came full circle, I guess in 2019, they had their 20 year anniversary and we headlined one of their anniversary shows. And so it was nice to kind of have our start there. I mean, 10, almost 11 years ago. Um, where we didn't know what we were doing. We barely had an original catalog and then to be able to come back and as one of their headliners. Um, they've been so kind to us. I mean, I wrote, I wrote the lyrics to Mermaid there. I've written a lot of songs there sitting at the bar. Um, I found a lot of musicians in my band from bands that played there because I'd worked there as a live sound engineer. So I kind of, you know, would meet a lot of people. They've been so supportive of us. Um, and playing there is a, is a really unique experience. It's a, it's very small. The room looks like a train car. 
Um, but it's magical. I mean, it really is. We've had some of our best shows there. I think one of the best shows we've ever played was there, it might've been in like 2016, 2017. And there was a blizzard. There was like, like massive snowstorm, like cars not allowed on the streets, um, snow, I mean like feet of snow. And we had a show and we were like, well, we're gonna still play. We, we all lived near the venues. So we're like, we'll play anyway. And people came out. I mean, there were people, locals who couldn't go anywhere. Subways weren't running, couldn't drive anywhere. And it was just kind of this magical packed show in the middle of a blizzard. <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't know what, what it is about that place that just, there's some spirits in there or something that really draw the music out of you and the performance out of you. And, and, and working there and playing there, it's a, it's a real family. I mean, it's, it's a, it's home. It's home for us. And we'll always have a home there and I'll never stop going there to see shows or just to hang out or to write. I mean, again, there's something about that place where I just sit down at a table and, and the lyrics just come out of me. I don't, I don't know. The, the owner used to be a set designer for the Met. So it definitely has an oh, aesthetic wow. to it. Yeah, it's like really beautiful and really vibey and, and yeah, but I don't, I don't know what, there's something in the walls there that you okay. can't, yeah, you, you can't just buy or build. It's just there, yeah. <laughs> it's great when you can find that too, I mean, for me, it's this venue out here in, the, uh, in San Francisco called the, the, the Fillmore. Um, okay. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, it's just so much energy there. And I have history there, you know, just like seeing so many shows there. And, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's a piece of me that's there, but it's just like this energy on the walls and you can get lost in the concert posters that are there. I mean, they give away these apples that, and there's like magic in the apples. I don't know what it is, but, <laughs> but they're, incred they're incredible. Not like an apple you get from the grocery store or something. I don't know. Right. But, uh, uh, but it's, That's it's so cool. cool. I, you know, I used to work uh, for a number of years at the Capitol Theater, which is in Portchester, mm -hmm. and it's the same kind of thing where they've been around forever. Everybody's played like in the '60s and '70s. Everybody yeah. played, got all the old posters up, and it's the same thing. Every show there, it's just there's something. It's just different and perfect and magical. I can I can see any band there, even a band I'm not a fan of. And it's a phenomenal show for some reason. Yeah. Those yeah. places are great. I, I hope I hope they all stick around. I know. <laughs> Losing some of them, right? And it's hard, but yeah. Um what's the farthest you've been able to tour? Um, so we've gone, we've toured and we've played in LA and um San Diego and kind of we almost played in San Francisco and our we had a a show that got canceled but so we've gone out to california we've gone down to texas and um gone up and down the east coast we haven't left the country yet but mm. I'm, I'm hoping we do soon um as soon as this surge is over um, we really want to go over to like the uk and um france and i mean i just can't wait uh but yeah as of now we kind of made our way around the states but not 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 outside of it yet yeah yeah and and so to kind of close out what's one of the most uh what's one of your favorite memories from one of those shows on tour or you know and one of those di distant locations that you had um so i think i mean there are a lot of good ones um but one that i loved was our, so the first year the first time we played in austin um, and we played at South by Southwest okay. and, uh, we played at this, uh, legendary place there called the Saxon pub. That's been, been there forever. And it's a cool place because it's not like in the heart of South by Southwest where like, it's just mania. It's a little outside of the center. So, um, there are more locals there than South by Southwest, like festival goers, um, mm -hmm. And we played and we played our hearts out and I was so nervous. I was just like, God, you know, it's our first show in Austin and we're, we're from Brooklyn and we're playing like Southern inspired music. Like, are they gonna, 
accept us? Like, are they going to like us? I, I don't know, but we, we really kind of played our hearts out. And at the end of our set, we got a standing ovation and they all started chanting, chanting, move here, move here, move here. And I was just, it was just like, I don't know, breaking down this, it's like ultimate acceptance when the locals during South by Southwest who the locals can't stand it. Like it's good for business and it's good for the businesses, but you know, they're overrun by tourists basically. And so to have their approval and to have them want us to move there or like want us to keep playing there was was really great it was like a big moment for me at least you know because you're up on stage you're vulnerable you're not sure if people are gonna get what you're saying or if they're gonna laugh at your personal experiences that you're singing about or you never know you know it's just such a self-conscious uh thing and and so that was great that was really an awesome moment so yeah <laughs> that's really amazing and bought all our, and then they helped sell our merch they like i don't know they just really it was like being accepted into a family it was it was really cool so oh well that's that's great and <laughs> and so what do you see i mean there's no way to really know but what do you see for this year you know so we're just getting started what is what do you what does this look like for you real plan um you know we did we did a lot of coping the last couple of years and kind of again like we've talked we talked about just now like music is cathartic and it's healing and and we kind of did what we needed to do in order to keep playing um but I really want to get back on the road like I really feel like this whole thing has kept us from being able to travel safely um and I just I'm hoping this year you know starting uh, we just found out we're going back to South by Southwest this awesome. month and so I'm just hoping that that's the start of us being able to just get out there and, and meet new people and go to new places and you know kind of all heal together by performing you know and listening and watching music and discovering new music and I just I, I can't wait I really am ho I'm so hopeful <laughs> that we're able to do that so you know my plan would be to go back to Austin go back to California um and then by next fall go to Europe and and other parts uh outside outside of the U.S. so that's kind of our plan to tour behind the album um you know in support of the new album but also see old friends that we haven't seen in like three years um yeah. go to back to those places and reestablish those connections and just be together in a venue. And yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for that. And, and we've already started writing the next album. So. Wow. So that'll, yeah. that'll happen in the next year or two. So. Not slowing down. Oh. No, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. can't. Nope. It's helping me stay sane. So <laughs> if I slowed down, I would lose my mind <laughs> during yeah. all this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I hope you're able to make it out to San Francisco and uh, and fully play a show. <laughs> yeah, uh, me too. I'll let you know if we do, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be great to see you live. It seems like you have a really great stage presence, and, uh, and uh, the new album's pretty awesome too. I, I dig Thank it. You. And, Thank yeah. you very much. The yeah. next one's going to be even better. I've already moved on. I'm like, oh, oh. this is already behind. <laughs> you are like, we can't really promote this one. We'll just move forward to the next. You yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's. that's that's awesome. Well, Lizzie, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. And, uh, of course. Uh, and definitely stay, stay safe, you know. And you too. Yeah, you too. We'll, we'll get through this. We'll get through this. We will. One. We got <laughs> this. We'll, we'll do it, you know, push forward, right? So. Yeah, yeah. 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 Really nice to meet you. And thanks. Thank you for your time too. That was the interview with Lizzie Edwards from Lizzie and the Makers here on Concert Pipeline. And that takes us to the final segment of the program, the music news. <laughs> All right, got a couple stories about what's going on in the music world. Um, and uh, so we'll hit those now. Uh, first up is a story about specially trained dogs that are used by Metallica Tool and others to detect COVID during tours. This is interesting, right? Um, I don't know that I can see this taking off, but, um, but maybe for the big festivals it could. 
you know, as you talk about Metallica playing bottle rock, you know, that could be a good way to detect some COVID out there. Who knows? Who knows where COVID will even be in May, right? What it'll be like. Uh, but a number of acts currently on tour have been relying on specially trained dogs to sniff out COVID-19 uh, before a show needs to be canceled. Uh, so, uh, as reported by Rolling Stone, Air Church, Tool, Metallica, and the Black Keys have brought dogs on board that are able to sniff for traces of the virus in anyone involved backstage, including members of their crew and entourage. Uh, if they detect the virus after sniffing people's hands and feet, they sit down. The dogs are managed by Ohio-based biodetection canine with 12 currently in service and seven or eight more in training. Uh, they were used by Eric Church in his U.S. tour in late 2021, and four German shepherds uh, will also accompany the Nashville singer and songwriter during his 2022 Gather Again tour, which kicked off at the Pinnacle Bank Arena in Nebraska yesterday. Um, talk about Metallica. They made use of the dogs during their 40th anniversary gigs, and two will be taking on a different team of dogs uh, when their U.S. tour begins in Eugene, Oregon uh, um, right now. So, um, there's other artists that are planning on doing this. Uh, I mean, I guess it's a good idea, right? I mean, let's talk, let's talk about it. Like, yeah, you put on a, you're a band, you invest so much money in putting on this big tour that has so many components, so many people on the payroll. Um, so like the fans are really excited about it. And, um, and a lot of them tra are traveling to, um, different locations to see, uh, these shows. And then, Last minute, you're like, well, sorry, guys, we've got to cancel the show. We've got to cancel the tour. And uh, and it's it's really a letdown. It's a letdown for everybody, right? The band hates it. The band's crew, the road crew, uh, who are relying on the, the, uh, the gig to happen to make any money. Uh, obviously, promoters are not happy. It costs a lot of money to cancel uh, the show. Uh, and and the fans, the fans who travel to see the band or you know are planning on going to these concerts are really let down because they're not able to see their their favorite band perform. And so, if these dogs can catch uh, COVID and then you know I, I guess they can isolate the person who has COVID uh, uh, away so that the show can go on. Um, I guess that's something that can happen. But um, biodetection canine president Jerry Johnson told Rolling Stone. People say, uh, what's that dog doing? It surprises them and they're pessimistic, but if you understand the instincts of a dog's behavior, it makes a lot of sense. Dogs sniff each other to see if that other dog has a virus. We're training them to look for uh, something they'd be interested in anyway. With multiple gigs continuing to be postponed and canceled, the, the, the dogs have been particularly useful with the rise of Omicron and have been trained to sniff people's masks, not their hands or feet as previously to detect the variant. The new variant is different, Johnson said. It localizes in the bronchial passageways, so the dogs aren't nearly as accurate the way uh, we had been searching. We had to change it up. Uh, so, um, and in, in other COVID news, the Irish government recently announced that it will pay approximately 2,000 musicians, actors, and other performers a basic income for three years. That is huge. That is huge. That is great for the government to step up and take care of its performers who um, are not able to make ends meet during this, this challenging time. So, uh, so good on them. Um, while we're talking about bands who've been around for a long time, the Rolling Stones um, are going to be honored by Royal Mail with a set of 12 special stamps. Um, this is marking the band's 60th anniversary. They're, uh, uh, the series' main set of eight stamps feature the rock icons performing at various global venues throughout their illustrious career, such as London's Hyde Park in 1969, and Germany in uh, October 2017, and Tokyo in March of 1995. Um, notably, also one of the eight stamps features the band's late drummer, Charlie Watts, who just died last year um, at age 80, performing in, uh, on stage in Germany in October 2017, which is a really good tribute. You know, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think also, he died at age 80. They've been around for 60 years. So he was 20 years old when, um, when the Rolling Stones got their start. Um, and an additional four stamps presented in a miniature seat uh, sheet featured two shots of the band and two promotional posters used on the worldwide tours over the years. So uh, I guess uh, England is the place to get those, I would imagine, but I'm sure you can get them online as well um, if you're if you're interested. Okay, 
So a man that was uh, was arrested for making a bomb threat in an attempt to skip a line at a Doja Cat concert. I'll just let that sink in for a second. This guy's trying to skip a line and he makes a bomb threat. You're an idiot, dude. What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, well, the show was able to go on as planned after the uh, police ascertained there was no real threat. Um, and the pop star topped a bill at the, uh, a free AT&T's playoff playlist live gig uh, held uh, at the city's Monument Circle venue, which also saw the likes of AJR and Pink Sweat perform. Uh, the Indianapolis Star reports that an unnamed man was arrested and the crowd cleared for around 20 minutes before the gates opened because of the bomb threat. Uh, the man reportedly told people uh, who stood near him in line that he had a bomb in his bag uh, in a bid to skip the queue. Does that work? Does that work? Okay, so we're in line, right? Uh, and you're like, God, I fucking hate this line. Really? I have to wait in line here? I have to stand in line with the likes of you? Why do I have to wait in line with you? I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm going to get to the front of this line so I can get in to see some Doja Cat. Um, right. Okay. Well, I have this backpack. I have a button. Let's see. I'm going to tell I got, I got a bomb in this backpack. You want to let me in front of you? Pass it on. Pass it on. I don't see that working. I don't see that getting you anywhere except um, behind bars. Not even in the, uh, the, uh, the concert. Sorry, dude. Uh, so Deputy Chief Joshua Barker said the fan had exercised very poor judgment quite an understatement, uh, but someone did the right thing and alerted IMPD, the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. When he was searched, his backpack was found to be clean. Um, so he was just an idiot. But, uh, but you don't say those things, you don't say them. Um, um, and in a post, uh, statement posted to social media, uh, IMPD added that the man had uh, unrelated outstanding warrants and was immediately arrested for those, okay. So the bomb didn't work out, but guess what? We got you for on other counts, uh, other, other things we were looking for you for. Uh, so at the time of the statement it was issued, he was still in police custody. Not the brightest dude in the world. Um, so um, the show did go on. Uh, everybody was able to move forward with, without that, you know, more on in attendance, right? So, all right, this last weekend, was David Bowie's, uh, would have been David Bowie's 75th birthday. And a lot of fans paid tribute to David Bowie on, uh, on this day. He died on January 10th, um, 2016. I can't even believe it's been six years uh, since he died. I just can't even believe it. And I know where I was when he died. Uh, I was with my kids in Seattle uh, on a, a trip that we took. And, um, and I told my daughter, and we listened to, uh, to the hell out of his album, Dark Star. We listened to it a lot. It was very touching and it really connected with me um, at that point. Um, so uh, fans have been flocking to social media to pay tribute to David Bowie on what would have been his 75th birthday. Uh, he of course died following an 18 month battle with cancer in 2016, but I don't think many people knew it. Uh, his seismic impact on music uh, and pop culture can never be overstated. His relentless innovation and reinvention was one of the great driving forces behind modern music, which in turn inspired countless musicians across a vast tapestry uh, of rock music, which he helped weave as he went. Uh, and it wasn't just music the star meant influence. His impact reached into fashion, performance art, film, and sexual politics, which earned him legions of fans all over the world. Uh, so, um, Happy birthday, David Bowie, and what would have been his 75th birthday? Um, uh, let's see here. I'm looking for anything here. Lenny Kravitz posted a photo of himself and David Bowie, accompanied with the ca caption, happy birthday to the Thin White Duke. Um, let's see. Uh, Paul Young shared a photo of him and David Bowie alongside Brian Adams. Uh, let me see. John, the official John Lennon Twitter account posted Bowie's, I don't think it was John Lennon who posted it, but <laughs> a performance of fame with the Beatles legend on the Share Show in 1975, writing happy birthday, David Bowie. Um, so many, so many people um, it's, uh, paid, paid tribute. Um, yeah, I know that celebrating David Bowie, the festival that I covered back in 2016, um, that 
in San Francisco, they did a 24 hour stream of David Bowie content um, that you could tune in at any point, uh, point for. Um, anyway, um, all this to say, um, our hearts go out to David Bowie and we'll, he will live on. He will always live on. His music stands the test of time. I listened to uh, you know, some David Bowie on his birthday uh, to just remember the mark he made. All right, I got one more story to wind out the music news. Um, and as almost always, it has to do with Dave Grohl. Uh, not necessarily something he did, uh, but in this case, but uh, something that was coming to a closure related to David Bowie. Uh, David Bowie, wrong David, uh, Dave Grohl. <laughs> uh, so the ju a judge tossed the lawsuit of the man who was new, the nude baby on Nevermind, um, that album. Um, you may or may not have heard, but uh, the young adult who uh, was uh, as a baby on the cover of the Nevermind album with his penis showing um, was suing Nirvana and everybody involved to give himself some exposure. Although I think he had enough exposure as a baby, you would think, right? But I mean, he's chopped that up over the years, you know, as a pickup line to women, want to see my penis again. He's, it was one of his lines that he used. And now he's trying to sue the Nirvana camp and get money wherever he can. So such in bad taste. Um, so the, the judge dismissed the lawsuit of a 30 year old man who alleged that the image of him nude as a baby on the 1991 cover of Nirvana's Nevermind is child pornography. Uh, the judge dismissed it, let me see. Uh, he granted a motion to dismiss the suit from the defendants who, including surviving Nirvana members, Dave Grohl. Um, oh, okay, I don't get to read the story, great. Um, I have to register. Anyway, he dismissed the suit. That's long and short of it. That's all that really matters in that case, right? Um, is that guy's not getting any more time of day. We should probably also stop talking about him on Concert Pipeline because he uh, doesn't deserve the attention. Um, on where do we move? Okay. So that is the program for today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I'll tell you a couple of artists that we have probably coming up in the, the coming weeks here on Concert Pipeline. Um, I uh, should be in interviewing Dale uh, Bazio, who um, is a uh, really cool musician. She, um, let me see, she was in, uh, she performed and recorded with Frank Zappa for uh, a while. Uh, she had a lot of great stories. I read her memoir uh, and really, really interesting. So I'm hoping to get a chance to interview her pretty soon. Um, also, uh, Lost Dog Street Band um, should be interviewing them and Ryan Colwell also um, most likely coming up in the coming weeks on the on Concert Pipeline. So that is our show. Uh, for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.